1967, I was 17 years old and going nowhere in life. My only ambition was to grow my hair long and become a hippie. The last thing I could have imagined was that I was about to begin a career as an artist and spend the next 30 years of my life in the art worlds of New York and London. It all began here in this crumbling old house in Fort Lee, New Jersey, known locally as the castle. It was perched on the Palisade Cliffs overlooking the Hudson River and New York City. It was leased by this man, Tom Daly. He was one of the most successful commercial artists in New York City. He was famous for his technique of body painting. This was a poster he created that became world famous. And he painted Diana Ross for the cover of Look magazine. One day, a meeting with, uh, with Tom and some of his friends gained me a, uh, an invitation to the castle. And I was dazzled with all these new creative people I met from New York. And the castle soon became my new hangout. The man in the background there lived on the third floor of the castle. His name was Tony Masaccio. He came from an old mafia family in Brooklyn, and he had movie star looks and a mesmerizing personality, and he moved in the artistic circles of New York City. Every weekend, he arranged some sort of a happening or a party out at the castle, he even uh, managed to get the movie Chow Manhattan starring his friend Edie Sedwick filmed out there. I wanted very much to be like my new friends. I wanted to fit in with them, and I started going to museums, galleries, and art shows with them. And uh, when I was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, looking at the paintings, especially the old masters on display there, I felt inspired and wanted to try my hand at painting. Tom Daly gave me my first paints and brushes, and I discovered that I had a hidden talent I was, I was totally unaware of. This was my first try at painting. The, pa <laughs> the painting wound up on the cover of this British counterculture magazine published in England. Uh, the entire painting was published on the inside of the cover, and Tom was quick to note that my, uh, my style and technique was very much like that of the old masters, just like the paintings I stared at in the museum. When I needed money for more paints and brushes, Tom jokingly suggested, why don't I paint an old master and try and sell it? Well, I did. My first fake was a small painting, very similar to this original by Van Eyck. Uh, I painted it on a small wooden panel, cracked it and aged it, and got up enough courage to walk into a gallery on East 57th Street in New York City and present it as an antique. An hour later, I walked out with 800 bucks in my pocket, and it, from that point on, it wasn't a matter of if I would paint another fake, just when. But my intention was not to, be, to start a career as an art forger. Instead, I moved into New York City and rented a small studio in this beautiful building at 43 Fifth Avenue. I wanted to be part of the movement at that time and put together a collection of abstract impressionist paintings. I started my collection there when my old buddy from the castle, Tony, rented a floor above a restaurant in this rundown building just off 14th Street. He suggested I move in with him where I would have more room to create my collection, develop it, and he could use his contacts in the art world to gain me some attention. The, as an added advantage, the studio was near Max's Kansas City, the famous art bar at the time. And if you wanted to get somewhere in the art world in uh, the 60s and 70s, you needed to hang out at Max's. I was busy putting my collection together when disaster struck. A botched plumbing job when we tried to put in a, uh, a bathtub in the loft, leaked water all over the floor and caved in the ceiling on the restaurant beneath us. I found myself being evicted in the middle of the winter with all my artworks and only $400 to my name. 
In a panic, I was running around New York City looking for a new home for myself and my paintings. And as luck would have it, I found a studio in this beautiful townhouse at 35 East 68th Street, one of the most glamorous addresses in New York City. And I was living in a beautiful Louis XV salon there, getting my collection back together and back to work, when for the second time in the, in the same winter, I found myself being evicted again. This time, the landlord wanted to empty the whole house out and lease it to a third party, but this time I fought back. It so happened that my neighbor was this man. His name was Roy Cohn, and he was one of the most dangerous and feared lawyers in the world. I appealed to Roy for help, and he intervened and brought a lawsuit against my landlord. For the next two years, while Roy was busy destroying the life of my landlord, I was busy expanding my uh, skills and branching out into Dutch paintings. This was an example of one. I needed money to live on the Upper East Side, and my collection wasn't ready yet, so I was painting pictures like this and selling them to galleries all around the place. A friend of Roy's who understood what I did for a living introduced me to this man, James Rico. Jimmy Rico was one of the most important collectors of 19th century American paintings in the country. He lived in this magnificent neoclassical mansion just 20 minutes north of New York City. He was eccentric. He lived alone with millions of dollars worth of paintings and sculpture in this house. Jimmy heard about me, and he wanted to meet me. And, uh, like I said, he was eccentric, and uh, he had an ulterior motive. He wanted to steer my talents away from creating fake Dutch paintings to creating fake 19th century American paintings. And under his direction, I started turning out paintings like these. Some of the most important uh, painters of the period, James E. Buttersworth and Martin Johnson Heed, uh, Gilbert Stewart, and uh, for the first time in my life, I started making some real serious money. My, my uh, technique was simple. I would uh, comb through the flea markets and junk, junk shops and buy a painting like this for 50 bucks, as long as it was antique, strip the, uh, strip the surface off of it, and then apply one of my own masterpieces. Business was really good, and money was rolling in. I even got my old buddy, Tony, from the castle and put him to work selling my pictures all around New York City. They first started showing up in the auction catalogs in 1978. This Sotheby's catalog featured two of my Buttersworths for sale there. I, I also painted uh, pictures by William Aiken Walker and Martin Johnson Heed and, and many others. But the problem was, we were flooding the market with paintings, and in 1980, the FBI started hearing rumors and uh, started an investigation. They rounded up Tony, and I was certain that I was heading for the big house. But Tony was used to this sort of thing, so he uh, brazened out the investigation. They traced nothing back to me, and instead of going to prison, I packed my bags left for England and moved into this place. With plenty of money in the bank, I was able to afford an apartment in the Royal Crescent in the city of Bath. I thought that I was reformed. After the close call in New York City, I had sworn off forgery forever. But when I started sitting in the auction houses in London and watching the British paintings being sold there, I realized I was only kidding myself. I realized that I was addicted to the intoxicating thrill of taking a risk, fooling the experts, and laughing my way to the bank. I couldn't help it, and I couldn't live without it. And within a year, I was happily back to work painting British pictures and selling them at Sotheby's, Christie's, and other auction houses throughout Britain. Eventually, back in the United States, I just simply painted the pictures, crated them up, and shipped them to the auction houses. And the catalogs were rolling in, and so was the money. This was one of my paintings sold at Christie's. Once in a while, one of my paintings would even make it into the newspapers. 
In this case, uh, here's a headline in the London Times describing how an American tourist found a valuable painting in a flea market outside the city of Bristol. Of course, I was the tourist that found the painting. But what I didn't tell him was that I painted the picture as well. <laughs> this painting here brought over $700,000 in Sotheby's in London, or in New York, rather. I even invented an artist that never existed before. I sold his work at Sotheby's, too. <laughs> but then, in 1998, rumors started <laughs> swirling again, and the uh, FBI caught on to my activities. They opened up an investigation that dragged on for five long years, and this time I was certain I was heading for the big house. But as the investigation expanded, and started compromising auction houses and art experts on both sides of the Atlantic, something incredible happened. It was suddenly shut down and quietly covered up. And once again, I slipped out of the net. Today, the irony of the situation was that they never stopped me from painting my fakes. And today, I still paint them, but I sell them legally as reproductions, just like these. But where they'll wind up in 10 years from now, we can only guess. <laughs> Thank you.